and if you're standing, it's going to be a minute or two, so you might want to find a place to sit down, but it's not going to be that long. I'm a very experienced preacher, and I realize when it's cool out there, you need to accelerate things a little bit. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. I knew your hearts were there. We're going to look at one passage of Scripture, and I'm going to ask you one question, and then we're going to have communion together. Go ahead and open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. The question that we've got for today is, which side are you sitting on? Which side are you sitting on? Now, some of the smart Alex may say my backside, but that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> but you know, this is the football season, and when you go to a football stadium, there's the home side, and then there's a little visitor side. You're sort of in this side or that side. My brand new son-in-law just started graduate school at Yale, and he said, we should go to the Harvard-Yale football game. I said, that would be awesome. And I had in my mind that, well, I would be sitting on the Harvard side because I'm in Boston. And uh, the brothers are play on the team. And I said, uh, he said, now surely you wouldn't consider sitting on the Harvard side with me, your new son-in-law there from Yale. I said, I would never consider that. It didn't cross my mind. But you know, it matters which side you sit on. If you sit on the wrong side, then, then sometimes that's discouraging. When the touchdown is scored and everyone's rejoicing and you're booing, that's a bad thing. But Matthew chapter 25 is a very simple passage. Today uh, we're having the Harvest Walk. We're, a lot of us are walking 5K to raise money for hope and uh, to raise money for the needs, uh, the needy around the world. And that's really what our service is about today. And you know, we're a pretty simple church. Sometimes people ask me, what kind of a church are you? I always say we're a simple church because we just simply take what the Bible says and say it. For example, the Bible says, if you don't repent, you can't be saved. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And what that means is, no, you can't go out and be immoral or adulterous or, or carry on as stealing or lying or cheating. You cannot live a life like that and think that that's approved, that will be approved by God. We also are a church that says, well, the Bible says in order to be a Christian, you need to get baptized. And so that's what we teach and that's what we practice. We also know that the Bible says that disciples should go out into all the world and make more disciples. I have some very encouraging news. Uh, you know, we as a church believe in world missions. We take up our missions contribution. We just did it this month. And at this moment, there's still more coming in. But just as a single congregation, just in the last month, we've given right about $700,000 to missions. Now do that. Why would people sacrifice so much? Because we believe in what the Bible says. And Jesus challenged the disciples to go to every nation. You know, in Matthew chapter 25, there's another very clear teaching of the Bible that I want to talk to you about just for a moment today. In Matthew chapter 25, let's begin in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all, and all the angels with Him, He'll sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. When the, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or, and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he'll say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then, he, then they will go away to eternal punishment, 
but the righteous to eternal life. Let's stop right there for a minute. You know, you don't have to be a theologian to understand what this passage is talking about. You can walk up here your very first time at church and you say, you know what, I think I get that part. That part is pretty easy to understand. Now the vision that you get, the Bible says God comes down and all nations are there, kind of like on this hill. And he says he separates them, the sheep from the goats. Now he says he puts the sheep on the right side. That's good news for this side of the crowd here. He said, this side over here is all goats. That's bad. You know, that, that's not a good thing. What can I say? You pick the wrong place. Next year, come early and sit on this side. <laughs> but basically, he says, okay, and he comes and he's sorting people. And he says, okay, we'll put you over here and we'll put you over here and you over here. You're a sheep. You're a goat. And he said, basically, then he looks to the sheep. Now, this is just figurative. You're not all lost, but I'm just saying. He says, blessed are you, there's a kingdom prepared for you. He said, since the beginning of earth, the beginning of time, it's been prepared, and you are blessed because you took care of the hungry, you took care of the sick, you visited those in prison. And it's very interesting because this group sounds a little surprised. They said, well, when did we see you, or when did we do these things? How did, we didn't notice it was you, Jesus. And the Bible says that he said, as much as you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. Then he turns to the ones on the left. This is the bad news crowd here. And he said, sorry, you're lost, you're gone. Because you never helped out. Come on now, from the back. She was positioned perfectly. That just shows you can pay attention even when you're walking around. But he, they, these folks were also a little stunned. And they said, now wait a minute. When did we see, if we knew it was you, Jesus, definitely I would have given you my clothes. I know I would have. And he said, well, you never did it to the, my brothers. So you never did it for me. You know, when I asked the question, which side are you sitting on? Are you sitting on the right or are you sitting on the left? Because the Bible here is very clear. As much as it's clear about the need to repent, about the need to be baptized, about the need to go into all the world, it's clear that we as Christians are expected, in fact demanded by God, to be involved in helping the needy that are around us. This is not an optional thing. This is not something we just do if we get a little chance. But can you imagine being there at Judgment Day and you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's a cloudy day like today, maybe the sky is bright blue, maybe it's night, I don't know. But there you are in the presence of God, and one of the real questions he wants to ask is, how much were you involved in helping other people who were less fortunate than you that were all around you? And he said he divides the sheep and the goats based on our participation in that. You know, you got a, a certificate of appreciation. Did you see that? Did you pick that up on the way in or were you just buying donuts? Okay. <laughs> but you know, one of the things that I'm encouraged about is that a church, as a church, we're dedicated to helping people who are needy around us. And this is just a quick summary of what's gone on just in our fellowship in the last year. Last November, you know, we have this each family feeds a family outreach. We helped 1,260 families last year at Thanksgiving. That's a very encouraging thing. And let me ask you a question. If you or your family group helped put a basket together to help another family, raise your hand right now. There's a lot of us who are involved in that. You know, not only do we have that, but we also have the Framingham Food Pantry, which we run all of the time. We help over 4,000 families to be served just in the last year. And our B grant, or the Peaches, the Paradises, the Hermans, or the Macombs, are you here? Stand up right now. If you're here, just go ahead and stand up for a minute. There they are, back in the back. That's awesome. We want to say thank you for helping us work and helping that community. It's been fantastic what's going on. Last December, we gave gifts to children, teens. There were 443 children were helped. And these were not just a little toy here or there, but this was 50, 60, 70, $100. And 400 children were helped by that. In addition, we had a, a, a party for 100 foster teens. You know, when you're a foster kid, Christmas is not the most awesome thing in your life. 
because it reminds you of what you don't have. But as a church, we pull together, and is Kim Farmer in the house? These are, I'm, I'm asking, but is she here? Where's Kim? Is she around here? She's probably off serving food somewhere. But you know, Kim helped pull that whole thing together in an incredible way. In January, now you think this is cold. We know this is not cold, right? Right. Because we know in January on Martin Luther King Day. Now, Dr. King went to Boston University, but if he were picking a day for his celebration, I don't think he would pick January. But in January, we go to the Red Cross and we say, what's the greatest need in the area? And they say, hey, the biggest need is fire prevention in January because people die in their homes because of mistakes. So we reached out to 31,000 households. If you were here, if you went out in January, stand up right now, get yourself a little circulation. If you were one of the ones who went out in January, that was dedication right there. You need a seat. It just seems like nothing to all those people. They think, wow, this is summer. I'm going to get a tan out here. Through Hope Worldwide, they raised $1.5 million for the work in Haiti Thank just you. this year. Amen. But that's a great encouragement. You know, we had 24 guys, it's not listed here, but there were 24 men who on average raise $1,000 a piece in a program called Hoops for Hope. Yeah. Now this ranged from young, zealous guys to old geezers. But if you did <laughs> Hoops for Hope, stand up your little frail selves right now. There they are. Worn out, they're still recovering, they got blisters. But I want to tell you how God blesses things. You know, you may have heard the story about the hospital in Cambodia. The Hoops for Hope program helped the hospital in Cambodia. In Cambodia, this last October, a year ago this time, they celebrate the one million patient that was served for free by that hospital. And during that one million patient celebration, there was actually a visitor, an observer, who was from another foundation. There was a German entrepreneur whose daughter had been killed and in a bicycle accident. And in honor of her, he built this incredible hospital, an $8 million facility. But just as it was completed, before it began to be utilized, he was taken seriously ill. And so at that point, they tried to think, what are we going to do with this facility? But you know, by the grace of God, one of their employees came to the millionth patient celebration, and they made a decision in the last six months to hand over to Hope Worldwide a perfect, pristine, unused, totally finished, built to German standard, $8 million hospital that's being wow. given right now to Hope Worldwide. Wow. There's runaway children in the house. She was fired up. Now also, though, we started out helping in, in, in Honduras and the medical brigade that went in both January and June. If you were involved in the medical brigade, please stand up at this time if you were one of the ones that went over. That's awesome. That's incredible. And you know, there's also been hundreds and thousands of dollars that have been given. But here's my question for you. It's clear, as a congregation, we're trying hard to meet the needs of the poor. But let me ask you as a person, because you know when we face the Lord, <laughs> you're not going to show a BCC membership card. Oh, Boston Church? Oh, you guys did well. That Honduras thing was cranking. Going over there. That's not how it works. We all face God as individuals. If he's parting the sheep and the goats, based on what this chapter says, which side would you be sitting on? You know, Matthew chapter 25 is an interesting chapter. The first one is about the ten virgins. Basically, it's saying the first section is about hurry up and get ready because you never know when God's going to call you. The second section is about the, par about the parable of the talents and the people who had great talents and used them well and those who buried it in the ground and, and they were called wicked, lazy servants. But that was about whatever God gave you, use it to do even more. And then he finishes the chapter talking about the sheep and goats. We're going to take communion in just a minute. But I want us all to reflect as we look into the clarity of the scriptures. Which side have I been sitting on? And what can I do more for God? We're going to have a prayer that's in the form of a song now. Oh Lord, prepare me. And then we're going to take communion together. The communion cups have been given uh, and we'll take those in our place. But let's sing a song together. 